Monseigneur, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs les ambassadeurs, chers collègues, chers élèves et chers invités, nous sommes ravis euh, ce soir pour euh, la dernière conférence de l'année de Stand Up for a Sustainable World d'avoir avec nous, son Altesse Sérénissime, le Prince Albert II de Monaco. Merci beaucoup de l'honneur que vous nous faites. Sans plus tarder, je vais laisser la parole au président de ESCP Europe, qui est également président du directoire des Galeries Lafayette, M. Philippe Houzet. Monseigneur, Mesdames et Messieurs les élus, Mesdames et Messieurs les administrateurs de SCP, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres de l'International Advisory Board, Monsieur le Directeur Général de la Chambre de Paris, Île-de-France, cher Stéphane, Monsieur le Président de l'International Advisory Board, cher René, Monsieur le Président de la Fondation, cher Christian, Monsieur le Directeur Général, cher Franck, chers professeurs, chers collaborateurs de SCP, chers étudiants, chers amis. Quel plaisir, mais aussi quelle émotion de vous accueillir dans les murs de notre écueil, Monseigneur, vous, premier monarque et chef d'État, à venir à la rencontre de nos étudiants et n'ayons pas peur des mots de la communauté ESCP tout entière, comme le démontre la diversité de cette Assemblée. Il est vrai que j'ai eu, en vertu de mes fonctions, l'honneur d'ouvrir des temps d'échange avec des personnalités d'une grande qualité. Toutefois, pour recevoir votre Altesse, l'école ne pouvait espérer un jour plus propice que celui de son bicentenaire, à la veille du dévoilement de sa nouvelle marque. Monseigneur, j'ai personnellement veillé à ce que l'école finalise un travail de refonte de sa marque et de ses valeurs, afin d'être mieux entendu dans sa définition d'un nouveau capitalisme axé sur les développements à long terme, nourri par l'innovation technologique et les choix responsables. J'appelle au travail en bonne intelligence de trois générations d'entrepreneurs ici présents pour faire face à ce défi. Quel honneur de constater que ce projet n'est pas seulement celui de notre école, mais que les États, tels que le vôtre, partageaient également les ambitions d'une société plus prospère, plus juste et basée sur une croissance durable. À cet égard, je vous renouvelle l'expression de mon respect, de mon admiration, de ma reconnaissance, de porter ainsi au plus haut niveau les profondes aspirations des générations d'entrepreneurs que nous formons. Je cède à cet égard la parole à Bertrand Moijon, directeur général adjoint en charge de la formation continue, initiateur de cette belle série de conférences et de votre invitation, Monseigneur. Stand up, all stand up for a sustainable world. Merci de votre attention. So I know this switch into English. It's my pleasure to welcome our very special guest, His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco. We are going to start with a video before having a presentation by His Highness. Thank you. Numerous projects supported around the world, combating deforestation, protecting endangered species, access to water, and ocean acidification. In addition to the supported projects, the Foundation also acts through its initiatives, the Med Fund, BMED, and the Monk Seal Alliance. It helps combat climate change and to curb the erosion of biodiversity.
Launched in 2015 by the Prince Albert II Foundation, the Med Fund seeks to promote sustainable financing to contribute to the long-term needs of marine protected areas. A global alliance of donors has been created. Its objective is the implementation of an endowment fund of 30 million euros. France, Monaco, Tunisia and the Prince Albert II Foundation are the founding members. An AMP is a powerful tool for the long-term conservation of the marine environment. More fish of all sizes, more species and more productive and healthier marine ecosystems. This is the best way to strengthen biodiversity while developing sustainable economic activities. The Med Fund contributes to this while combating climate change by retaining carbon in the biomass. The Beyond Plastic Med Initiative was launched on the 10th of March 2015 to combat plastic pollution in the Mediterranean. Every year, more than 8 million tons of plastic are released into the ocean. Drifting across the seas, plastic can choke or smother many animal species. With the effects of the sun, it fragments into microplastics that can be ingested by fish and thus enter the food chain. So it's a potential threat to human health. The Mediterranean is the most polluted sea in the world. Ecosystems and biodiversity are permanently affected. BMED helps reduce plastic pollution by working with civil society and businesses. It supports 38 micro-initiatives in 12 Mediterranean countries. And its corporate club encourages the private sector to find innovative solutions to act on the entire life cycle of plastics. The Monk Seal Alliance was launched on the 8th of April 2019 in Greece. Prince Albert II reminded attendees of the difficult situation facing the Mediterranean, of which many species have their stocks dangerously reduced due to human activities. This is the case with the monk seal. This emblematic species is particularly vulnerable to the effects of urbanization, pollution, overfishing or navigation. The Monk Seal Alliance brings together donors and experts to strengthen the preservation of the Mediterranean monk seal. Its action amplifies the scope of actions carried out by monk seal conservation specialists in the field to save this emblematic species in the Mediterranean, along with marine biodiversity. Tous ces enjeux exigent plus que jamais une attention particulière. Ils appellent une mobilisation globale. Ils réclament une action rapide et efficace. Les bonnes volontés sont de plus en plus nombreuses. Les moyens d'action paraissent encore souvent trop rares. Nous devons rester vigilants, déterminés et ambitieux. Now I am delighted to invite His Highness the Prince Albert II of Monaco to join me to the stage. Your Excellencies, Mr. Chairman, Director General, uh, Presidents and uh, distinguished guests, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I am particularly delighted to be among you here this evening and to have the opportunity to, to speak to you about one of the key challenges of our future, and especially uh, on this day and especially on this year where you are celebrating your bicentenary. And uh, I wish you the best wishes of continued su success. So this is the key challenges of our future. And uh, because you all are in this room, uh, the future uh, on the, in this part of the world. It is the environment in which your generation will live. 
It is the universe which will be built by your generation, who all over the world is already demonstrating its intention to become actively involved in the environmental battle. And this future is also the universe for which you will be held responsible. You have been given the opportunity to study here in this prestigious school. You who are destined to fulfill important functions. You who will soon have the power to engage, direct, and guide businesses and people. That is why even more than others, you need to be aware of the issues that shape our world and our future. You need to understand the extent to which the climate and biodiversity are decisive and unsurpassable factors of our collective future. You will need to take action to protect them, to ensure their sustainable management at all costs. You are well aware of the situation, the grim statistics accumulating month after month and the increasing number of disasters and extreme weather events. You have probably read about uh, September of, of this year being the hottest ever, ever recorded on planet Earth, yet one more record after so many others. You have no doubt heard about the unbelievable temperatures that, that were recorded the following month, 35 degrees Celsius in New York, 36.7 in Washington on the 2nd of October, 33.6 in Kyoto at the same period, not to mention the 44 degrees that were recorded in Doha, Qatar, during the World Athletic Championships. This is the autumn that I'm talking about, but the summer was obviously worse, with temperatures of over 51 degrees in Algeria, 32.5 in Sweden, close to the Arctic Circle, and of course, our 46 degrees in the Gare, right, right here in France in July and 42.4 degrees in Paris. You have also heard about Hurricane Pablo in October, which formed over the Atlantic, the closest ever recorded to the Portuguese and French coastlines. And obviously you have heard about the fires that have ravaged our planet. More than 15 million hectares of taiga burnt in Russia in eight months. Gigantic fires in California, Indonesia, Brazil, and more recently in Australia. Perhaps you have also read the, the conclusions of the reports published by IPBS, often described at the, as the IPCC for biodiversity. And the horrifying figure, one million species living on the Earth's surface or ocean floor are threatened with extinction in the short term. One million from a total of 8.1 million animal and plant species known today. This means that one species in eight is in danger of disappearing. In vertebrates, this represents 25% uh, of mammals, 39% of marine mammals, 41% of, of amphibians, 19% of reptiles, and 13% of birds. In the plant kingdom, the figures range between 16 and 63%, depending on the species. With for, for example, 34% of conifers being at risk also of extinction. Yet we are aware only of a tiny fraction of living species as many of them will disappear or will have already disappeared without our being able to measure the, the, the loss. And most importantly, we know that the mechanics of the destruction is racing out of control if nothing is done to stop it. Experts predict a further acceleration in this global extinction rate. You have already heard of all these facts, but very often in a piecemeal fashion, behind the scant accounts of these phenomena d delivered to us by the news, uh, by different news reports day after day, it is sometimes difficult to understand that there is a single phenomenon. Behind those temperatures a few degrees higher, resembling one-off heat waves, behind the slightly increasing number of fires, behind the disappearance of species we don't always notice, but like a crisis of unprecedented scale and speed. An upheaval of the overall balance of our planet, the, the prospect of ravaged ecosystems, destroyed coastlines, lifeless seas, infertile land. 
as a consequence, an increasing risk of famine, epidemics, and conflicts. And the 250 million climate refugees that the UN foresees by 2050. 2050, a time when you will be at the pinnacle of your career, when it will be your turn to lead the world. I know that faced with such challenges, taking action may seem difficult. And I won't lie to you, it is, as I witness every day. I also know that sometimes trying to take action may seem futile to some, but I'd like to tell you to what extent it is not. This too, I witness every day. I would urge you most fervently to beware of all those who intentionally or otherwise offer no perspective but discouragement. Those who say that climate change does not exist or that we don't understand its causes, of course. And worse still, those who also say that the situation is hopeless and accuse the world without looking or offering any kind of solution. Faced with this type of discourse, I'd like to say that we can take action. And I would like to illustrate this with one example. When I was barely much older than most of you in this room, uh, in, in the mid and late 80s, the issue of global warming was not yet in the main environmental issue. Uh, and th that was of concern to, to all of us. It was uh, what was then known as the hole in the ozone layer, which scientists had just brought to light. The depletion of the ozone layer, particularly above the poles, was a result of the use of fluorocarbons, or CFCs, uh, and these gases which were widely used at the time. The ozone layer protects us from solar radiation, as you know, and especially ultraviolet rays. Had it vanished, life on Earth would have been virtually impossible. That was why, in 1987, the first international agreement, the Montreal Protocol, was finalized to phase out CFC gases. And unfortunately, its effect remained limited, and the ozone layer continued to deplete. Following international mobilization, amendments were made to the Montreal Protocol and in 1990 and 1992 with a view to putting a complete end to CFC production. Since 2009, this text has been, has been ratified by, the, by 197 member states and organizations of, of the UN, making it the only universal treaty to date. And scientists have now confirmed that not only has the hole in the ozone layer shrunk, it is now in, in the process of closing up. And this is in, this indisputably the result of the ban on CFCs. I find th this example interesting in that it brought into play global action supported by strong mobilization of public opinion. Of course, it is much easier to eliminate CFCs than to do away with, with hydrocarbons. And from this point of view, the lo lobbying efforts uh, uh, from this point of view uh, uh, do not have the same weighing. But this example should give us hope because it proves that action is possible at a global scale. As far as I see it, it is possible, provided it is based on four pillars. First of all, solid scientific expertise, because we need to identify the cause of the problem and the effective solutions. Then the states who need to build a framework which will make the change possible. Civil society, of course, which will sometimes need to prompt political leaders into action and agree to follow them in what may be onerous changes. Finally, the businesses which have a key role to play because they alone are capable of giving form to, to the innovations hoped for by society at large. They alone, for instance, were able to develop gases whose use did not harm the ozone layer. Knowledge, power, will, and development. These are the four steps needed for effective action to overcome the threats that are lying ahead.
<clears throat> I, I would like to go back over these steps because I, I believe that they can inspire you as they have inspired my action for close to 15 years now as the head of state of uh, Monaco and of my foundation. First of all, science. If we have the opportunity to take action, it is always because scientists alert and enlighten us. And if we are able to take action together, it is because science allows us to make a shared and irrefutable assessment. That, that is why we need to support the work accomplished by the scientific community. This is what my foundation does through different partnerships with the major laboratories and universities worldwide and through scientific events and meetings, conferences, uh, it instigates or supports. And this is also why uh, what, what we did by supporting the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, since it, since it was at the request of the Principality and of the partners and my foundation that a special report devoted to the oceans and the cryosphere, i.e. The, the planet's ice fields, was produced. The report was published in Monaco last September. And I hope that this will enable the, the role of the oceans, which, may I dare remind you, re they represent over 70% of the planet's surface, to be given greater consideration at future climate negotiations. Indeed, the oceans are the first victims of global warming. However, the oceans also suffer, uh, so, I'm sorry, also offer solutions for the migration of global warming. But scientists need communication channels when they tell us, for example, that we need to stop using hydrocarbons to mitigate the effects of global warming. Or when they will tell us to ban neonicotinoids to prevent the, the loss of pollinating insects. They need political decisions to transform these truths into action. That therefore, it is up to leaders, it is up to heads of state, heads of government, members of parliament, and local deciders, mayors, have an important role to play, to propose trade-offs, co concrete solutions, because politics is very often a matter of arbitration, of equilibrium, of striking a balance, even if it is often difficult to understand or to accept. It may seem obvious as outsiders to prohibit hydrocarbons immediately. Some voices have called for this and accused all of us of cynicism. But do they understand that this would mean preventing many people from traveling? This would mean stopping many people from working, that this would mean condemning whole sectors of the economy, that this would probably lead to unemployment, poverty, and even hunger. Which leader, which responsible leader, uh, which head of state or of government would want that or would want to take that risk? In order to move away from hydrocarbons, and we need to move away from hydrocarbons, to accomplish this energy transition, which is one of the greatest challenges of this century. We need realism, patience, but also determination. The same applies to changing the agricultural model. Every decision needs to be carefully thought out, evaluated, and deployed in a timely fashion. This is what the major international conferences focused on the climate and biodiversity endeavor to, to achieve. COP25, which is going to take place in a few days in Madrid, Spain, under the presidency of Chile, and uh, COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is being held in China next year, or the negotiations regarding the conservation of, of the high seas biodiversity at the United Nations. I know that these conferences give rise to some disappointments, but they also enable us to make progress uh, through these negotiations by taking into account the conflicting interests of the various parties involved. Taking into account the interest of, of the parties involved, being concerned about both the present and, the fu and future populations of those living in comfort and of those who strive to do so. Reconciling the interests 
of humanity and nature. This is the whole crux of the matter. And uh, that is the biggest challenge. But it is also there uh, where we will find many solutions, where civil society has a key role to play. Reconciling these interests is what my foundation does, for instance, by helping to fund and develop marine protected areas in the Mediterranean, which are currently the most effective solutions to protect marine biodiversity, provided that all the local players are involved and feel empowered. Reconciling these interests is also what my foundation does by training new generations of experts who will foster the coexistence, for instance, of Indonesia's human population and its rainforests, or by supporting programs to reintroduce species wiped out a short while ago by us, by, by humans. And for example, uh, this is an example that the foundation has uh, uh, had, or the, the program that uh, we had uh, several years ago now, uh, the bearded vulture uh, the, and the reintroduction of the bearded vulture in the Alps and Corsica. Moving forward, whilst taking into account the interests of the parties involved, is also what we do in Monaco with, for example, the, our policy to promote clean mobility, which consists of, of various incentives, financial and technical measures. It is also what we do in terms of construction by encouraging energy efficient improvements, buildings, and by creating ocean thermal energy loops, which enable us to harness part of our heating and cooling energy from the sea. All this obviously requires time. Such policies cannot be achieved in a day and need to be further reinforced. Because in Monaco, as elsewhere, environmental awareness is developing and is developing at a fast rate. Increasingly often, society, and especially the younger generations, are calling for a world which is more sustainable, more environmentally friendly, more attentive to other species, and less damaging to the climate. And we need to encourage, support, and prompt this change as well. In this respect, I've seen how things have changed in just a few decades. This may appear to you, or to most of you, to be in a very distant past, but I took part over 25 years ago with my father uh, at the first major international conference devoted to the climate, the Rio Summit, and that was back in 1992. At that time, the environment, an issue uh, to which I was already ex extremely sensitive, was only of interest to a few activists and a few scientists and a few, and, and very few organizations. T today, it is one of the first topics broached by those I meet, whether they be politicians, economic players, or simply people concerned, as you are, uh, for their future and for the future of our planet. But, but this new awareness uh, changes positively many aspects. By, by way of example, I saw this when I decided with my foundation to take action 10 years ago to save the Mediterranean bluefin tuna, an emblematic species which was back then critically endangered. <coughs> and in order to do that, we, we decided, of course, to approach the competent international organizations, but we also decided to mobilize public opinion uh, by alerting them on the consequences of the consumption of, of bluefin tuna. More importantly, we managed to make the various economic players aware of the need to protect this resource and to manage it in, in a more sustainable way. Pro pro so professional food services, distributors, including fishermen, joined us, and together we succeeded with other organizations to save the species. And this brings me to the fourth pillar of the alliance that, that I mentioned, the economic players. R I think regardless of their business sector, they need to understand that in the long term, nobody stands to benefit from environmental destruction, uh, from seeing the climate deteriorating from witnessing the extinction of different species. And no business can cut itself off from the aspirations of the people it serves. 
and from the forces which help it thrive. Of course, such awareness also requires time. It is a matter of conviction, but also of negotiation. And I'm convinced that reasons that reason, sorry, always triumphs. I've seen this in the partnerships generated by the actions implemented by my foundation with businesses keen to get involved in this global battle and in the plastics sector, for, for example. And I've seen this quite simply by observing around me, by seeing businesses embrace this conversion. Ad admittedly unequal, admittedly unequally genuine, but very real to ecology and sustainable development. More and more, they are beginning to understand the extraordinary potential that lies within this. Many growth drivers for our economy exist, whether we are talking about green growth or blue growth, about renewable energies or waste recovery, about responsible farming or the circular economy. This is also the message I wanted to convey to you. Uh, interests as, as economic, uh, always remember that in the long run, your interests as economic players cannot be opposed to your interests as human beings, uh, nor uh, those of your children. On the contrary, to, to be responsible uh, means that you'll be able to create success over time. Be innovative, be inventive, be positive. This is how you'll be able to save our world and give meaning to your careers. And I'd like to conclude by, by reading two quotes which I think correspond to, you, to this situation and to your situation rather well. The words of a poet and the words of a corporate leader. The, the, the first is by Victor Hugo one of the men who did the most to make this country great and to promote justice in the world. He said, daring is the price of progress. The dawn dares when it rises to strive, to brave all risks, to persist, to persevere, to be faithful to yourself, to grapple hand to hand with destiny, to hold fast, to hold hard, such is the, is the example which nations need. The second is by Steve Jobs, one of the people who contribute most to, to shaping the current world and to changing the meaning of the word innovation. So he once said, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes, the ones who see things differently. The only thing you, you can do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward, and while some may see them as, cr as, the, as the crazy ones, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. I hope that these two masters will inspire you will inspire us and encourage you, you to dream, to innovate, and to change the world to make it a fairer and more sustainable world. Th thank you very much. Your Highness, many thanks for this inspiring presentation and this call uh, for action. Uh, it's no time to turn to questions. I'm sure that we have plenty of questions in the room. And I think someone has a microphone. Yeah, question here. So uh, good evening, Your Highness. 
Thank you for inter your intervention at ESCP Europe. It was a real pleasure to accommodate you. Uh, so nowadays, um, more and more people pay attention to environmental issues, such as young generation, exemplified by uh, young leaders such as Greta Thunberg. Uh, so my question is, many people in the room actually have some cliches about Monaco. And uh, do you think that Monegasques are aware of environmental issues uh, despite their consumerist lifestyle? Thank you. You know, we, we, we've been able to implement and to have different programs. Uh, you, you saw some of them in, in, in the short film about, about plastics, but um, there are uh, different uh, programs that we've been able to introduce into schools um, and different awareness campaigns on uh, not only waste management, not only uh, 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 the different uh, issues that I was talking about, about, uh, about new building uh, regulations and about, and of course, about plastics and about uh, uh, gener uh, generating less, less waste and, and, and trying to reduce our, our, our waste. But we've w worked uh, a lot in recent years on, on, on clean mobility and on the need to, to move gradually toward uh, uh, vehicles that are not only less polluting, uh, but to move, uh, of course, toward electric vehicles, uh, and hopefully uh, down down the road to other forms like uh, like hydrogen, uh, but which can can be applied also to different types of transportation. So all this has has led also to um, uh, not only on the on the youth side and on the educational side, to um, the uh, to uh, to establish. A, a plan for our energy transition, and so we uh, came out with a with a white paper, and then with a with a, a energy transition pact that has signed that has been signed by over over fifteen hundred uh, different entities in Monaco, not only businesses, uh, not only different uh, d different departments of the government, uh, but uh, many uh, many different entities as I said, entities, but also individuals. And so I think everybody in Monaco is aware, uh, but is also, has also committed to uh, uh, a certain number of, of, of steps to uh, meet the goals uh, that uh, not only were set by this energy transition pact, but of, of course uh, the, the finality of, of all of this is not only to, to reduce our carbon footprint, uh, but to stick to the objectives that were set out, that, that we set out, that I set out for Monaco uh, when I signed the Paris Agreement. So, so that is a 50% a reduction of our, of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by hopefully before 2050. Good evening, Your Highness. My name is Juliette. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, my question refers to um, the project of building an eco district in Monaco. And in order to build it, um, an, an artificial extension will spread over a uh, natural sea area. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think not building it would have been a more sustainable solution? Thank you very much. As you know, Monaco had, had to uh, think of new innovative uh, solutions th throughout its history. And so that's why uh, this is far from being the first uh, e example of a land extension on, on sea since uh, close to 50 hectares have already been uh, gained on the sea over the past decades. Of course, back then, we, there were no or very little uh, marine environmental impact studies uh, that there is now, and that was the absolute prerequisite for this land extension project, which I, I, will, I will remind you is uh, only six hectares. Uh, so uh, on our scale, of course, it's, it's a big project, but uh, if, if you compare it to other uh, 
land extension projects around the world, it's, it's, it's a very reasonable size. There were other projects, uh, th there was another uh, project launched for that same area uh, 11 years ago, and uh, th this uh, first project was abandoned, not only because uh, they were considerably larger but, uh, and more costlier, but because uh, none of the project answered uh, our environmental impact uh, rules and requirements. And so I think this, this came, uh, this was very carefully studied and there was a special uh, committee uh, of experts who approved all the uh, different steps of uh, not only the procedure to, uh, to get the building permit, but, but also uh, to approve the, the plans of construction. And that went from removing uh, and moving to a different area, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the seagrass beds that were on the bottom of the sea in that area, and to move some uh, endangered species like, like the pen shells, which unfortunately since then uh, we, we, we discovered also, and we were hit by other areas in the Mediterranean that they unfortunately have a virus that has nothing to, that had nothing to do with uh, uh, whatever silt was in suspension due to the construction <laughs> process in that, uh, in that part of Monaco. But so, um, so we were, th this was done very, very carefully, all the removals of the seagrass and, and these different species, but every step of uh, the construction of this land extension uh, has been fully vetted by uh, a committee of experts. Good evening, Johannes. Good evening. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, you've helped with your firm many projects that aim to prevent uh, the acidifying process of the Mediterranean Sea. However, it remains the, one of the most po polluted sea uh, in the world. So, um, what are the future projects that you have found will help and do you forecast to launch other projects uh, that would gather many states and associations together? The Mediterranean, well, as, as other seas, but, but even more so than, than other seas and oceans, because it is a semi-closed sea, is subject to a lot of different pressures, uh, not only by, the, by maritime traffic uh, on the Mediterranean, and, but uh, uh, crosses the Mediterranean from, from uh, the Oriental Basin to the Occidental Basin, but but also because of the population increase on its shores. And as you know, but this is a worldwide statistic. Uh, right now it's 40% of the population that lives within a 60 kilometer band across all coastlines. Uh, but in, uh, at the end of the century, it'll be 80% of the world's population that live w within 100 kilometers of a coastline. So that is a huge, if we're not careful, that is a, that is a huge uh, pressure on marine coastal ecosystems, but also on, 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 other, uh, on other ecosystems uh, even further away. And so we have to be very, very careful of that. And that's why we, we have, uh, we're pushing and we help different studies, uh, not only in ocean acidification, and we held the first uh, first really international conference on ocean acidification in Monaco in uh, two, two, 2008. Um, and there was a declaration signed at that time that scientists from different countries uh, 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 got engaged to, to uh, accelerate the studies of ocean acidification, but also on other issues. And, and we saw, I, I will just cite two, Two, two examples that, that I think are very, are very relevant, and, and, and we saw that in the film, and I alluded to that in my remarks. Um, uh, the first one is uh, the Mediterranean Trust Fund, uh, which uh, we were able to initiate along with France and Tunisia, then other countries 
joined us to uh, create a fund that would be able to uh, help financially the setting up of different marine protected areas around the Mediterranean because the Mediterranean is, uh, l was lagging a little bit behind in terms of effective marine protected areas, which I repeat is really uh, one of the only uh, real solutions to, to, to restrict uh, not only in, if it's done properly and if it's uh, monitored properly uh, to uh, ensure the regeneration of marine ecosystems when you protect it, be it fully protected or, or the, there are varying degrees of protection of course, but we try to encourage a, a full protection. Um, then these ecosystems will, will be able to regenerate very, very rapidly. And then the second is the, is the BMED project, which is a, a coalition of, of different entities that have, program, that, that have launched programs uh, to reduce uh, or clean up or um, uh, reuse uh, plastics uh, in different countries uh, bordering the Mediterranean. And so, and, uh, and so the foundation started this program with uh, obviously other, uh, other partners and it's, and it's worked out not only extremely well, but it's proven uh, to be effective in, in, in some communities uh, in, uh, in different countries around the Mediterranean. And so uh, I, I think these examples show that uh, if you engage local, local people and local stakeholders, and different, and of course, of course, scientists with with the help of scientists, but but if you engage people uh, on uh, and local authorities uh, with a specific program and concerning their area, well, they take uh, they, they they take stock in that, and, and they and they want to be able to prove that they can help. In this in this process, and so I hope that this will this example of the Mediterranean uh, will uh, be followed by others. And and, uh, and I have had different uh, uh, different people around the world that have asked uh, about BMED and, and how they can they can transpose it in their part of the world. So I hope that we will we will uh, continue in these areas. Uh, not only for the Mediterranean, uh, but for uh, other seas around the world. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to move to the second part of this event, and we are going to award the doctorate honoris causa to His Excellency. So I call to join me to the stage Frank Bournois, Dean of ESCP Europe. I call to join us on the stage Philippe Houzet, President of ESCP Europe. I call to join me on the stage Léon Loluza, Dean for International and Academic Affairs. And last but not least, I call to join me to the stage Valérie Moiti, Dean for Faculty of ESCP Europe. Your uh, Serene Highness and uh, Your Excellencies, Bernard uh, Rotrier and uh, Sir Christophe uh, Steiner. A special mention also to uh, Mr. Frédéric Jantar, who is, uh, I know, an ambassador of the school uh, to you, and uh, who is uh, an example of uh, a very international uh, graduate of the school looking with foresight I into the future. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman Philippe Houzet, Mr. Chairman of the Advisory Board, René Ricol, Stéphane Fratacci from the Chamber of Commerce, dear uh, colleagues, dear students and dear friends, we are now entering a, a special uh, moment in this ceremony. It is an important one because it has to do with the awarding of the doctorate honoris causa. His Highness has already a lot of them, 
uh, around 20 in this world, which is uh, considerable, and I understand this fully. However, this evening is going to be the doctorate honoris causa that uh, President, Ou President Ouse and, uh, and the team here of the faculty, um, and it means something special to us, I told you already beforehand, because it is awarded on a very special day in the history of the school, this school being, of course, the oldest business school in this world, which is uh, trailblazing, in a way, uh, what companies and what leaders of tomorrow will be. Uh, just for uh, a little bit of history, honoris causas were first awarded in this world by Harvard University in 1773 or so. Far before the uh, University of Harvard uh, created its business school in the late 1883. And uh, today there is a special message because delivered here in France, it's not only a national doctorate honoris causa that we're going to be awarding, but a very special European one. And this is the, the, the spirit uh, of it all. Um, Your Highness, thank you so much for the uh, many lessons that you put forward in your, uh, in your speech. They are very meaningful in this assembly, especially as we have uh, professors who uh, devote a lot of their time and energy to work on such topics that cannot go unanswered. I'm thinking particularly of Professor Aurélien Aquier. I've seen him, I don't know where he is in this room, but I would like to pay tribute to the big efforts being made in the school on those topics. Thank you for the uh, encouragement that you have also uh, shown tonight. And there are so many lessons, I will not go into all of what you said, but I think that uh, as a head of state, walking the talk with a foundation and translating this into action, I like very much from the uh, uh, bluefin tuna, and it's not an anecdote, to the importance of local decision makers, I think you said deciders, there is something in the spirit of the school that is totally aligned um, with your ambitions and what you're achieving. And indeed, in a business school like this, we very much cherish and like when people do and translate and they are led to what you called arbitration. And, and this is very important because I think that in this very much changing world, one of the big qualities of future leaders is undoubtedly being able to discern, to see what is going to be good, what is going to be problematic, or what will not be finding answers. And uh, I won't be uh, too lengthy, but I would just like, of course, to say that uh, awarding uh, Nonoris Cosa Doctorate, only started in France in, uh, I think, 1918, so that's uh, one century ago. It has to do with the recognition of special outstanding contributions to the world of uh, sciences, art, and also for personal uh, dedication to special causes. So it goes without saying that uh, we have, we've what? you achieve and what you also lead others to achieve in that domain, that we are very honored and very happy collectively here to uh, award the Doctorate Honoris Causa of ESCP Europe. You have a school which is uh, always innovating. I was telling you in private that this is where the term entrepreneur was first coined and used in its uh, modern uh, sense. And it's very important that this uh, doctor, uh, doctorate um, comes after uh, not so long a series of awards. You are not on the list of hundreds, it's uh, 
less than uh, 15 of those that have been awarded in, uh, at ESCP. Uh, the last person, the first person who was awarded a doctorate honoris causa at ESCP for uh, this assembly's uh, information was uh, Jeff Emelt, the CEO of um, General GE. And, and, and the last person who got it in this very room, on this very stage, um, was uh, Jean-Pierre Raffarin, former uh, Prime Minister of France and an alumnus of ESCP Europe. And just to show that there is also diversity in, in the world of uh, doctorates, uh, we also had uh, Nicole Fontaine, uh, who passed away and uh, as, a, as, a, as a chairperson of the European Parliament. There are insignia, there's not only a degree going with the ceremony, but there is also a, a very symbolic uh, uh, sort of insignia, which is uh, here very French, and just, uh, although it's international in its meaningfulness, you have here the three rows of ermine corresponding to the traditional medieval ranks of bachelor, master, and doctorate. And this is what, if you allow me, I'm going to uh, bestow onto you, again, with the many thanks of, of, of the school, and that is correlated, of course, to the big encouragement that uh, you are providing on these issues of sustainability, of course, for better decision making, to create a better world, and as our chairman would say, creating, uh, of course, activities and business for good. Your Highness. The, uh, the degree, per se, of the school in the presence of our chairman, Philippe Pouzet, and the two deputy director generals of the school. With our immense and genuine recognition, you are and will be always at home here at ESCP. Chairman, Director General, uh, member, distinguished members of the faculty, uh, students, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'd like to thank you most sincerely for, for this honor that has been conferred upon me today. Uh, the honor of receiving this prestigious award from such a renowned and important institution, not only celebrating it's bicentenary, but uh, I now uh, am fully aware that it is the oldest business school still active t today. And I congratulate you on this. I take this insignia as an achievement, of course, but a great source of pride, but also consider it as a duty, uh, an additional incentive to pursue my action, that of my foundation, uh, and that of Everybody that has joined, uh, joined us in different partnerships uh, for this uh, great cause and this great ambition. But, but above all, I'd like to say how humbled I am by the trust and friendship uh, to which this evening is testimony. The trust and friendship of the discussions that I've had with the school's officials and with some students, albeit unfortunately a very short conversation, but um, the trust and friendship accompanying uh, your kind in invitation to take the floor here this evening. And the trust and friendship 
uh, surrounding the more informal conversations that we've had. But last but not least, the trust and friendship on which the partnership that we are working towards uh, between the Principality and ESCP is, is based, the focus of which will be sustainable real estate. As you know, real estate is a strategic issue for the Principality of Monaco as much as it is and has been for many years a center of excellence. Supporting the, the, the development of this sector, encouraging it to engage in a more sustainable and modern approach, these are the challenges uh, that uh, we have decided to, uh, uh, to work on and to address uh, collectively. Uh, we will do so by sharing our talent, our expertise, and our technology. More importantly, we will do so by prolonging the spirit of trust and friendship that has presided over, th over this evening and over these proceedings. So I thank you wholeheartedly for this a wonderful uh, moment and, and for this great honor that you have bestowed upon me. I thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much for your uh, kind words and uh, engagement uh, into uh, sustainable real estate which is one of the uh, specialties that we have at ESCP Europe. Thank you very much because we have dedicated uh, professors and, and researchers, uh, not just from a national perspective, but from a very European and international perspective, that are really dedicating their time. And I'm happy that anything that will be done will be also helpful uh, not just with the foundation that you are uh, leading, but for uh, the uh, bringing forward of uh, a new world also, where those aspects of sustainability will be taken into account on all of those different uh, facets from uh, economic, environmental, and indeed uh, social. Thank you very much for... Uh, your uh, considerable uh, engagement and commitment into this. We have um, a great professor, I'm thinking of uh, Jaime in, uh, in, um, in Spain, and, and, and I'm certain that uh, Jaime, maybe you can uh, stand and uh, uh, incarnate in a way uh, the new generation of uh, <laughs> professors. Uh, who is uh, a, a very true uh, European academic. He also studied and taught in the US uh, for some time. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you appreciate, as well as we all do in this uh, assembly, uh, the big challenge that we have, and, and of course, uh, the uh, priority that we will be for our school uh, to contribute to the challenges that you mentioned for the Principality. I'm happy also to say that all this take, comes into account and in the remits of um, our school's foundation, and I'd like to uh, also mention President and Chairman uh, Christian Mouillon in that respect. Thank you very much indeed, on behalf of everyone at ESCP. Thank you.